This is apparently in like the world's top five most dangerous passages. I was getting really psyched out by everybody around us. We've crossed the time zone. So, oh, it's a megapod, it's huge. Look at this wave, they're all catching it. South America's over there. Last time on Red Seas, you saw us face a huge thunder and lightning storm in Curacao before we decided to lift anchor and squeeze our way out through the narrow channel in the dark. Our auto helm gave up as soon as we lifted the sails, and so we found ourselves hand steering through the night and all day to reach Aruba. After we had complained for long enough, the local pod of dolphins stopped by to cheer us up, and through our sleepy state we even managed to dodge the reef on the way into the customs dock. So we've been in Aruba for two days now. We've kind of caught up on sleep. We're definitely feeling a lot more human again. Uh, and just in time, because a weather window for the next leg of our passage has just kind of pulled forward, crept forward from where it was. And so we've actually decided just to set sail tonight. So we haven't even stepped foot on Aruba. We don't really know anything about the island whatsoever, uh, but that was kind of the plan. We knew we were gonna come here and not have a whole amount of time, but it was a good launching point to carry on. So we are setting sail tonight to Cartagena in Colombia. We're gonna reach South America! It's like it's all new, it's all different from the Eastern Caribbean where we've been the last couple of years. We have got the first 24 hours, I think, are going to be quite high winds, quite rolly, but then as we come around that cape at the top of Colombia, I think just all the wind is going to die and we're just going to stay coastal the whole way down. So it should take us around three days to get there. Um, yeah, we'll kind of just figure it out as we go along. It's one of the scarier passages that we've done. There's lots of kind of obstacles and things to be aware of as we go along. But hey, we'll, we'll just, you know, we'll deal with that when we get there. It'll be fine, let's just go. What Bernie didn't mention is that this is apparently in like the world's top five most dangerous passages. And we have not really prepared. So this is gonna be great. What could go wrong? We've got everything we need here. Lift anchor and go with the wind. And hope that there aren't many waves. Ready to go? Ready to go. Okay, so we didn't get to talk a lot overnight. Kind of difficult when it's one-on-one, -on -one, like I'll take a shift and Bernie takes a shift. But uh, suffice to say, the reason they say this route is like in the top five most dangerous. I'm not sure how true that is, but um, basically it's down to the size of the waves that are involved and the changes in the wind. So the waves can climb up to like two, three, four meters, but really close together. So we're kind of following uh, a ridge where it's 500 meters deep over here and like 50 meters deep where we are now. So the current and the wind push the waves up against that wall underwater and then they become these mountains. Um, so yeah, through the night we had to deal with some of that, but um, it's actually eased up a little bit now. It's the morning, of course, and uh, the sun is rising just behind me and the waves are kind of steadying out a little bit. Um, yeah, we're miles from anywhere, as always. I think somewhere over here there was a lighthouse, which marks, actually marks a Venezuelan Coast Guard outpost of some sort. And uh, our next stop is gonna be a peninsula, which Brian will tell you the name of, because I can't remember how to say it. It's in Spanish. But it's gonna be our first sighting of South America. It means that we are actually onto a new continent. And for us, that's kind of a big deal because that means that Brandy and I have both set foot on every continent on the planet, with the exception of Antarctica, which I would love to do, but um, I'm not sure if Indioko would want to go there. We'll have to see about that someday. But, uh, but yeah, so it kind of ticks off a big milestone in some ways for us, and it's not far to go. It's, it's just over the horizon here. One of our passage. It has been a rolly old night. 
The waves were quite big, they were coming from all different directions, so we haven't really got much sleep. But I managed to get to sleep for a couple of hours just as the sun came up, and now we've switched out and, uh, and Ian's gone to try for a bit. So uh, yeah, we're going well, we're making good speed. We've just uh, had our excitement for the morning and saw a massive container ship come down on our starboard side. It's kind of all you can get excited about when everything else is just blue. But then I glanced over on our port side and we can actually see land. I can see Colombia, I can see South America. I have never been there before. This is new and exciting. And uh, yeah, it's kind of becoming real. So it's odd because it's like, it's not an offshore passage, but it's a three day passage. So it seems like, you know, a sizable chunk of time that we're out here, but actually kind of forgetting that most of it is going to be coastal. So. We're coming to the end of our open water part. Um, hopefully coming around the Cape is not gonna be too lumpy. And then, yeah, I think things are gonna die down after that. We're just approaching the northernmost tip of Colombia now, Punta Galinas. So we're just gonna come around this corner and probably jibe when we get there. Uh, we've just crossed over from the dark blue water into the light blue water. So it always looks really surreal as you kind of sail across such a defined line in the color. And I'm always nervous that we're going to suddenly kind of run aground or, uh, you know, the waves are going to kick up because it's so much shallower. But actually, we're just sailing along, uh, we're just sailing along a ridge. So we've actually not changed depth. I think we're about 73 meters this whole way. So I've put the fishing lines out. Uh, see if we catch anything along here. I'm so tired. I'm kind of hoping that we don't because I don't want to have to prepare anything. But um, yeah, the next couple of hours, we're just kind of cruising along. Conditions are stable. It's definitely evened out a little bit. It's not as rolly as it was earlier. We still got big waves, but uh, yeah, the current is just helping us out massively and just keeping us going along about six knots and winds dropping down to 15, 16. Yeah, it's beautiful. All right, so I was about to get really grumpy as I woke up because I looked at the clock and it looked like it only had like two hours sleep. Turns out we've crossed the time zone. So we are officially gaining an hour in our lives and we're spending it sitting around on Indy. <laughs> oh, well, when you put it like that, I was getting really excited. It's like making as big a deal of it as if we've like crossed the international date line because it's our first time zone. This it's probably is our first time zone, actually. Yeah, not that right. big a deal to other people, but. Well, it, it's only because it's like walking across the time zone in some ways. Like we sail yeah. across it, you know, at walking pace. <laughs> it's not in a plane, which is what most people would do, I guess, or in a car. Yeah, it gives you time to get used to the extra hour before you reach there. So have we gained an hour or lost an hour in our journey? Uh, I'm so confused. I actually don't know if that means the journey is an hour longer than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> or if that means it's an hour less than we thought it was going to be and we're going to get there a bit earlier than we thought. I don't know. Who cares when you're out sailing in the ocean? Pretty much. <laughs> in other news, South America's over there. Ah! We can actually see it. We're only like five miles off the coast of Capo de la Velo. Vela? Capo. Cabo. Mm -hmm. Cabo de la Vela. We really need to learn, practice our Spanish before we arrive. I can see a beach though. Mm. It looks lovely. I like South America. Yeah, there's hills, there's beach, there's blue water. I could live with this. Yeah, no fish yet. I know, both lines in and it's a bit quiet, but eh. Either way, we're getting there, right? We are getting there. And we only have one neighbor at the moment, which is a sailboat out there who's showing off because they've got a, a slightly better light wind sail than we have. So they can fly it in these winds and they are going about nine knots and we're going well, we were going like 8.2 before you... Oh, yeah, yeah, the fish was huge and we were going 25 knots. Yeah, I didn't yeah. think you were going to tell anyone about that boat because they're going faster than us, so we just pretend they don't exist. <laughs> it's only when we overtake someone that we're like, oh, look, there's a boat. Ha-ha, we're winning. <laughs> Do not look right at the back of the boat. It's quite scary. So, yeah, that's kind of the state of the nation. State the, of the nation. The nation of Indioko. We should have a flag. All right, the time has come for the one and only sailing maneuver in this entire passage. Uh, we have been holding our Genoa off on our port side for the last 16 hours, something like that. And it's finally time to do the jibe. We're just going to do one jibe and take the entire boat from heading up towards Panama to heading down towards Cartagena. That's basically all we have to do this whole passage. So we're, um, we're kind of chilling out, to be honest. But anyway, this is one bit of work we better get started because we're getting further and further out into the deeper water. We don't want to do that.
is not the proper way to do it, but uh, we, we use our midship cleat to create what's called the barber hole, which just means that our Genoa can stay further out, which is like a larger surface for the wind coming from behind us. But most people put that on like a block and a soft shackle and stuff. We just wrap it around the cleat. It does the job. <laughs> That's probably, the job. That's what we're all about. Yeah, probably isn't great for the line and stuff, but you know what? For now it'll do. There's a mum and a baby and a pod over there. Oh, it's a megapod, it's huge. There's millions of them. Wow. We've never had this many dolphins in front of the boat. Probably bring the fishing lines in, huh? <laughs> Just chilling out behind the boat, that's crazy. Yeah. They are just chilling out under the boat, yeah. like they're under the dinghy. <laughs> dolphins we're always like oh we should put a GoPro in and see if we can catch it and uh, this time we actually have the GoPro and the battery is charged so we're gonna try it Ian's hanging off the back I don't know if the visibility is gonna be really poor because um, the water is kind of a strange color but yeah we'll try it and we'll see what we get and we just have to hope that he doesn't accidentally let go of the GoPro and leave it drifting off behind us I filled in one of the fishing lines because I was scared they were gonna munch on it and get, or get caught or something oh they're so cute That was nuts. That was so cool. I don't think we've ever had a pod of dolphins that big. Like that was easy over 50. Yeah, from what I saw. More than. And they were surfing behind the boat, which is weird. We've never had that. So they would surf behind the boat and then go under the rudders and then sort of catch the waves with us. Yeah. Whereas they normally all hang out on the bows. So I thought I'd come forward and see, but I think they've gone. Yeah, maybe they've headed off. But they were so relaxed. <laughs> Just surfing along gently. They're way out there now, I think. I think I just saw one. So there are kind of two schools of thought on which route you should take when you're sailing along the coast of Colombia. A lot of people stick out at the thousand meter line um, and some people go much, much closer to the coast. So we've taken the advice of some friends and we are only five nautical miles off the coast. And actually, although I was skeptical, <laughs> Sorry guys, it actually seems to be paying off. The waves have come right down. They're only about a meter now instead of maybe two and a half earlier. And the wind has been super consistent this whole time. We're just getting about 20 knots and we are just cruising along beautifully. So yeah, if it stays like this, as we take the coastal road down the whole way, then uh, yeah, things should be easy. That's the end of day one, settling in for the night shift. It's just coming up on day two of our passage. <laughs> when I say it like that, it makes it sound like we've only just started, but because we started at night, we've actually been sailing already for 36 hours. So I'm feeling like much more in the rhythm of things now. We slept a lot better over the night. Um, the winds have calmed down hugely. The waves are still like super chill. Uh, we had to motor for a couple of hours overnight, but we've just put the headsail back out again and we're sort of creeping along at four knots. So 
I think when Ian wakes up, we'll probably put the spinnaker up. Um, I was nervous about coming around the Cape and I've heard lots of reports of kind of huge gusts of wind coming down or these catabatic winds coming over the mountains. And I'm, I'm sure there's still time for that to come. Uh, but at the moment, everything seems super calm. We've only got about 15 knots of wind true. So yeah, hopefully the spinnaker will get us moving a little bit. The whole game of today is basically just playing around with our timing. So there's a river, uh, the Magdalena River, which comes out of Barranquilla and apparently all sorts of debris comes out of this river. There's a huge current coming out into the sea and like washing machines or the carcass of a cow or a car um, like float by your boat. We heard reports just a couple of days ago of people who had to dodge a tree the size of their boat. So we definitely need to cross that in daylight um, and we're about 24, 25 hours away. So today we're just going to be monitoring our speed and making sure that we keep up, uh, I suppose, not go there, not go too fast because otherwise we'll get there and it'll still be dark. So um, yeah, we're just kind of pottering along and, and it's actually turning out to be quite lovely. I'm slowly learning that I need to just trust in myself. It's got such a name for itself of being this really dangerous part of the world to sail in. And the winds can really whip around that cape and the seas can really kick up and it's a rolly ride. And, and because there's all that rumor, people just love to like get in the gossip of it. And so everybody's flying around with these opinions. And most people have never done the passage before because they're all the people who are talking about it and wanting to find information. And if you have done it before, they've moved on and they've gone somewhere else. So they're not around here to share their wisdom. So um, yeah, I was getting really psyched out by everybody around us. And I was feeling really, really anxious coming into this. And I think I'm just, ever so slowly learning that there comes a point where you just have to stop listening to everybody else. We know our boat, we know the experiences we've had, we know how we sail her, and yeah, we just have to learn to trust in ourselves a little bit because we picked the best weather, weather window that we could. Um, we had to you know, wait for the big, big winds to, to pass through at the weekend, and they're starting to die out now, so we're just kind of clawing on the back of it, but it was nothing to be scary about, or at least so far. And so, yeah, I'm not very good at believing in myself and, and assuming that I can do things, but I'm trying to learn. <laughs> it's a nice way to learn though. I mean, look at this. <laughs> 